Good afternoon. Uh, very soon it's going to be New Year. Uh, we're going to do something we do every year. We're going to wish each other a happy New Year and a good health. And like always, we have this intention, yes, I'll exercise a little bit more, I take care of my food, but then the next day we move on, possibly even digesting the dinner of the night before. The problem with our health is that we only value health when we are about to lose it. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about healthcare, medicine, where are we, and especially what are the challenges, but also opportunities as we look into the future. And I just want to take one metric, just one statistic, which tells us a little bit of where we are in the healthcare system. And that's a very simple number. It's essentially the life expectancy for a newborn, the number of years that a young child is looking forward in his life. And here, something truly unprecedented has happened in the history of humanity. We saw on a global basis that we added roughly 20 life years uh, to that uh, metric, to that statistic. In some parts of the world, even 30, 35 years. And we all know that, unfortunately, behind that number are large geographical differences, social difference also. But it's really, really uh, remarkable. And it's good to remind ourselves what has contributed to that increase in life expectancy. For sure, one of the big factors is lifting people out of poverty, making sure there is good sanitation, good housing, properly food. Uh, also important is that we, we recurb child mortality, and you see a number of those factors shown here. But if you look very carefully, really the increase has been due to evolutions, rather revolutions in medicine, like vaccines, drugs, diagnostics, medical devices and also a whole series of specialties was born. So we made a lot of progress. Unfortunately, all that progress came at a cost. Literally, we're spending, give or take, around $7 trillion a year on healthcare. And that number is rising. And just to frame that a little bit, it means that our Western countries, for instance, are spending roughly 10% of our gross domestic product on healthcare. In the United States, it's even north of 15%. And earlier this year, we saw that at the large conferences, the projections were made until the, uh, the year 2040. And you can see that a number of countries are going to spend one-fifth, more than 20% of, of their GDP on healthcare. And this is, this is really a problem, because those numbers are fueled by a number of factors. For instance, aging. In 2020, one out of five uh, will be uh, aged over 65. There are expected to be 50 million new cases of Alzheimer's. We have a diabetes epidemic and so forth. And it's, of course, as we grow older, that most of our uh, access accession to healthcare uh, is needed. So when we look back a little bit uh, at medicine, how is medicine being done? And what do we have to rethink in the way we deliver our solutions, the way we invent solutions, in the way we deliver healthcare. Most of the time, it has been the tradition to only access healthcare when we're really feeling sick. We're not going to a doctor when we, don't, when we feel well. So we go to a doctor, and then the, ch the challenge for that doctor, maybe for ourselves, is trying to find out what's wrong with us. And historically, the tool set that a physician had was to ask questions, to ask where we feel the pain, and then try to find a remedy. Essentially, try to put, your, put you as a patient in a box, in a category that fits a particular disease classification. Now, when you then give a treatment, unfortunately, in reality, we see that not everybody in that box that fits that particular disease classification is responding. In some cases, we may have forgotten to take our drug. Maybe in exceptional cases, the doctor made the wrong diagnosis. But even if we've taken our drug, even if it was, it was the traditional correct diagnosis, we see that not everybody is responding in, this, responding in the same way. Some people even don't respond at all. And so, of course, that's very bad for the patients who do not respond, but it's also very bad for our healthcare system, because why spend billions of dollars, and that's really what's behind these numbers, billions of dollars on treatments that do not work? And so the big revolution that we have today is that we're trying to, that we are really finally realizing that we're all equal, but definitely not identical. 
and certainly not at the molecular level. And one of the insights has really come from much of much of research by the life science community. We finally were able to decode our genetics, our genomes. We have three billion building blocks in our genome. Originally, it was a bit of a disappointment that out of that genome, uh, only a few percent it encoded for uh, a little bit uh, more than 20,000 genes. We now know that those 20,000 genes or more are, in, are really the, uh, the, build, the blueprint for, for, on average, around 2 million uh, different proteins. And only a few weeks, months ago, a large uh, scientific consortium revealed that, in fact, behind those genes and proteins, there's a whole tens of thousands of regulatory elements that control those genes. So you can imagine that behind this genetics and the way that the genes are working, that a lot of uh, mistakes and problems can arise causing diseases. So genetics and the way that our genes are regulated are just the starting blueprint. As we just heard from another speaker, there are many other factors that are explaining why each of us, in terms of disease and health, have our own stories to tell. There's obviously our lifestyle. Just the diabetes epidemic is an example from that. And we start to unravel also the molecular pathways in which lifestyle, nutrition, even the environment is influencing our risk for disease and also the way uh, that our diseases are progressing. So the future of medicine is really making this personal, making this much more holistic. What if, to reference to the previous speaker, what if we could figure out molecules in the human body that tell us that we run a risk for a particular disease. Now, personally, I would like to know only those things which I can do something about it, but if I could do something about it, I definitely would like to know. It is obvious that if we are much, much more efficient in picking up the signals, the molecular signals, long before, years before the disease arises, that that is not only good for you and me as a patient, but it would save the healthcare system an awful lot of money. And then when, unfortunately, we fall uh, into disease, can we make sure that we have an accurate uh, diagnosis? So the future is really identifying the right therapy for the right patient at the right time and location and in the right dose. We'll see a much more higher entanglement between pharmaceuticals and diagnostics. And I'd like to end here with taking you on a voyage inside really the challenges. We've heard about tricorders. But in reality, unless we find out some selective transporting system, we have to start with clinical samples. So in this video, I'm going to take you a little bit to some of the challenges. We just put a cotton swab in a wound, and we're trying to find out what bacteria is causing the infection, and maybe if that bacteria has a particular mutation. So the first challenge in that sample that contains billions of molecules is really to go after the genetic material. In this other example, we just uh, have to analyze a tumor slice, a biopsy from a patient, in which we have to add chemicals and processes to really release the genetic material from the cancer cells. Our goal here is, is to find out what exactly has gone wrong in these uh, cancer cells, and then uh, try to uh, provide for that patient a targeted therapy. In this animation, we show some of the extraordinary challenges. A clinical sample is very heterogeneous, sometimes it's not even liquid. So after making sure that that sample is liquid, we have to separate often the genetic material from the billions of other molecules that are present in that clinical sample. That requires a lot of chemicals. This is also the reason why many of these tests are carried out in very sophisticated laboratories. But then probably analytic, one of, analytically, one of the biggest challenges is that we have to zoom in in that genetic material. Finding the needle in the haystack is a vastly oversimplified challenge here. So in this particular part, we have to come up with solutions that we take the genetic uh, material into reaction chambers, and there, we, with very precise chemistries, we have to zoom in and try to see if that genetic code is changed, and if it's changed, to what form, and how many of those changes are present here. Right now, you see how using specific targeted chemicals, we're zooming in on, on that genome and using uh, this particular biotechnology product, we're turning the presence or absence of a particular uh, genetic mutation into a light signal. And by repeating this process, it's a technique called PCR, which has been around for a long time, 
but really has been, uh, until recently, really uh, limited to be performed in very specialized laboratories. And as you can see here, uh, this is the way we can identify in any particular genetic material whether or not these mutations that are important for disease are present or not. So I'd like to conclude that the future of medicine will see a vast explosion in new biomarkers, molecules that tell us about risk and type of disease. It will take many years to figure out how to use them exactly, but we truly believe that our innovation challenge for us is to bring this diagnostic to the magical moment where the patient and a physician meet, to, to provide the solutions uh, for the future. And I think this will, will be a, a future that is personal in terms of medicine, and it will require acting together. I think all of the players will have to do their best. Industry will have to find out to work on new and better targeted molecules. Society and payers will have to stimulate innovation and to pay for value and consider that in a holistic way. I'd like to conclude here with a slight modification of a famous saying from a future philosopher. I believe he came from Vulcan. Live a healthy life and you may live longer. And if you live healthy and long, I hope you, your kind and humanity can prosper. Thank you.